And then you move down on this aisle and you got the bike from the 40s. Then I'll go ahead. We can go ahead and listen to it. You're gonna see that same cover over here on this um, old police bike. Back then, this would have been the first bike to have a four cylinder engine, the first chain driven cam, the first water cooled. So once again, every perfect plan is never perfect. Um, my flight got canceled this morning to head back to Jersey. So spending an extra day out here in beautiful Milwaukee and beautiful day it is. Not too hot, sunny, blue skies, blue skies. So we're gonna spend a day here at the museum. So the museum was crazy packed in the day. So I can't, uh, couldn't really see everything. Um, there was a bunch of stuff that I missed. A few rooms that I didn't go to, so it's pretty much, empty now it's like not even a line trying to come up here so gonna take advantage of this now i get to see the engine room which is pretty awesome um it looks like i take my time and read a lot and everything and uh see what else i can see thank you get right on it thank you sir it's pretty awesome how they have this uh this bike all taken apart and uh as you step over you have the exhaust the tank the frame, the motor, and the fenders, and the tires, and the light and battery. It's like, it's, this is, it just looks awesome, man. Look at that. So this is the engine room. They literally have every engine on the backboard right here. Look at that. Um, you can come here and just read information on each one. You got these screens right here which you can change around and um, read about every engine that you can. You can come over here by the wall, look down at this screen right here. It shows you the engine wall. And then what you're able to do is that you're able to pick any engine you want uh, and then read about it. So let's just say we're gonna click the knucklehead. We can go ahead and listen to it. We can zoom in, just look at all the details on the engine, flip it around, go back, uh, photo gallery, and you can see the engine on basically all the bikes that I was in, and go back. Uh, and then you got some facts here, experimental vehicles, so the projects didn't get much further than these engine mock-ups. Harley Davidson was working on a design for a knucklehead powered light tank for the Canadian military in 1943. Oh, close that out. What else do we have here? We have a big twin legacy. So we got more more information about everything right here. Um, we'll go back to the engine wall. Let's hear the pen head. Just do one more. Let's listen to shovel head. Let's just uh, bring it all the way to the Milwaukee now. I want to listen to something. <coughs> Obviously a quieter sound, but you can still hear that Harley Davidson distinctive potato sound in every engine since the beginning, which is great. It's really awesome that you're able to come here and just listen to every engine, learn about it, get some artifacts, and it's like super cool. But just uh, the transition from the beginning, um, from all the engines that were developed in the early on years, you can still hear that Harley-Davidson sound in each engine. 
Um, each one has a very distinctive sound. But still with that classic potato, 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 potato sound, which is like so iconic. So right here behind me, we have the uh, 1907 Model 3. This thing is absolutely beautiful, uh, similar to the serial one. Um, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. I just want to read this for you guys right here. It says, the 1907, this bike cost $210. It could travel over 500 miles on one tank of oil. A feature tested personally by co-founder Arthur Davison when he rode a 1907 model to New England to recruit even more dealers. This 1925 uh, came with the F head right here. This thing is absolutely beautiful. Look at that. The paint on it, the motor, even the floorboards look, they look modern. Today, this is something that you would find. Those type of floorboards on the uh, modern baggers now. It's pretty cool. This bike right here is probably something that I would have if I was alive uh, in that time. Black and red. Uh, These serving cars right here are always uh, pretty cool to look at. They were mainly used for mail and delivery and all sorts of uh, businesses. But um, they look awesome. So this bike right here really, really stood out to me. This is what kind of, this would kind of be the first fairing ever. So back in the 1920s, um, as the roads got better, um, people were, you know, riding around, driving around uh, in cold conditions back then. Um, cars obviously had more coverage, but uh, since a lot of people use these motorcycles for work and deliveries and everything, or even just the average person who wanted to ride something, they could use this as coverage. Um, so I think I kind of like a fairing. So this is a leather material. I guess this, this is what they would wear in order to, to stay a bit warm out there. You're gonna see that same cover over here on this um, old police bike. It's a 1936 VLH police side valve V twin. These are the uh, the military bikes that we used back in um, World War II. This one's completely outfitted with everything saddlebags. You got that cover right on the front, um, holster in the front for the guns. Um, just absolutely beautiful. So these uh, dispatch bags were given to the soldiers on every bike uh, with the essential tools that they would need in case of a breakdown. Extra lights, a uh, piece of chain, spark plugs, uh, just a little a light, a bunch of stuff on here. Pretty cool. An ammunition case. I think these bikes that are displayed here from the 30s probably have to be my favorites in here. Look at this. This this will be my bike. But once again, the black and red because that's my road glide black and red. I just I love that color combo. Um, it's beautiful. But even this green one, um, I think this green one is my favorite. I came uh, on the tour the other day and I looked at it. I'm like, wow, that, that green one has to be my favorite old classic bike in here. That's a 36. Um, red one's a 34. Uh, this blue one back here is a 38. Just jaw-dropping, beautiful, man. It's like, I can look at these bikes. I can sit here on this little bench and look at these bikes 
all day. And then you move down on this aisle and you got the bike from the 40s, also beautiful. And then as we step down right here, you're gonna start with this 39 and then it goes into the 40s. So you got later date bikes down here on this side. And these bikes are absolutely beautiful as well. But there's something about those bikes from, uh, from the 30s that just, wow. Competition is a really important part of the Harley Davidson growth in the early part of the company's history. Um, we started, we did some flat track racing. Um, board track racing when it started was not something the company wanted to participate in for a very specific reason. It was really dangerous. So these board tracks were made out of wood. They were outside. They weathered. They split. The wood split. All of these motorcycles were total loss oil systems, so the boards, the, the splintery broken boards would be covered with oil. These are motorcycles going 100 miles an hour that have no brakes. So um, lots of injuries and deaths among the riders and the audience members. So the motor company wanted nothing to do with it until they realized it's a, it's a way to test out their machines. So they'd always participated in competition, even the four founders. So we've got photographs of William and William Harley and. Um, Walter Davidson on endurance rides, right? They would take the motorcycles out on these three-day rides to push them to their limits and see what they could do and um, work, you know, work with the engineers to improve the functioning of the bikes. They use the, the um, board track racing and other competition for the same reasons and they're still doing that today with King of the Baggers, right? But some of the, the um, race um, detail, the, the details on the race bikes, the p &A details are showing up on some of the production bikes now. So this next bike right here, this is a bike that uh, never made it to production, but could have and would have changed Harley's history and to present times right now. It would have changed everything. Um, this is the Nova. You might see something similar like the FXRT, FXRP bike. Um, that's what that initially was uh, designed or taken by after. But prior to that, this was the uh, original design of what that bike, what the FXRT came to be. Back then, this would have been the first bike to have a four-cylinder engine, the first chain-driven cam, the first water-cooled street engine, amongst a lot of stuff. And then, what we're also going to have in this room is all the AMF products from back in the 70s. We're going to have the scooter right here. That's fun. <laughs> this bike right here. This golf cart. Um, a boat. Yes, a boat. This little bike, and yes, a snowmobile back then. So, 70s were uh, an interesting time, to say the least. Now, after you leave this room, you can hop into this special room right here where you can sit down. Watch a short little clip. This is where they talk about how the eagle soars alone back when uh, Willie G and a few others were able to buy out Harley Davidson from the AMF company, which was going to get sold to uh, the Japanese. Um, so, yeah, thank God that didn't happen. Now, I gotta say, one of the coolest things that came out of those days had to be this bike right here, this this cafe racer. It's body, this bike is. This is one of those bikes that can possibly get made now with the Revolution Max engine. Because um, they have pretty much a lot of similar components, and um, I think it'll be a, a, a big seller, but this is it right here. said, we have an opportunity. This was in 1981. I just got all the officers together and said, we're 
This bike right here behind me has a crazy story. Uh, this bike was lost in Japan during the tsunami in a tanker, got dragged across the Atlantic to British Columbia, and it was discovered, and it, it's, it's amazing. And so uh, it's just here decaying away. Hasn't been touched ever since, but a uh, crazy story. Um, a year, a, you know, a lot of people lost their lives, a lot of damage from that experience. Um, a year later, um, a guy in British Columbia was beach combing on a remote beach and he found um, a, a container on the beach and in the container was a motorcycle, what? a Harley Davidson From motorcycle. Japan. And he came back, he couldn't do anything with it at the time, by the time he got back the container had washed to sea, but the motorcycle was still there on the sand and he um, worked with a local British Columbia dealer to retrieve the motorcycle. Harley Davidson helped track down the owner of the bike in Japan and um, the gentleman had lost, he, he survived, but he had lost family members, he'd lost his home. He did not want the motorcycle back. Um, but we've got it here on display as um, just a memory and a recognition of that event. We've had a hog chapter from Japan come and um, make a gift in, in memory of um, people who lost their lives. The bike is, is not conservable um, because it was uh, exposed to so much salt water and the sand, it's basically um, just corroding away. Um, instead of hiding it in storage and letting it disappear, we've decided to bring it out and have it on display so um, people understand the story and kind of the international connection between the riders. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. Like it's, it's crazy, sad, but it's beautiful. Oh my God. Now as you walk in um, from outside of that room, you're gonna walk down here. This is the first floor, so back behind me, you're gonna have the uh, Mama Tribe bikes that are on display towards the back, and then a ton, a ton of other bikes right here, which we're gonna see from the 80s and onward. Uh, this is the cafe racer right here that I was talking about before. This is, this bike is amazing. Just look at that. Super cool. This is like the definition of retro. FXRP, you have the cafe race right here. That's the sports there's the XR, sick. This super glad right here, this is a pretty cool bike. There's a local guy right around me who has one of these. He shows up to all the local bike events back at home in Jersey. And um, it's pretty cool that I saw the bike in person. I can see it here in the museum as well. So yeah, down on this floor right here is where uh, a lot of the bikes from the uh, Mama Tried event are on display right here. So it's pretty nice. Nice little display of everything. about 500 motorcycles in the collection. Museums generally have three to five percent of their collection on view at any given time. So um, in addition to the motorcycle collection, we have hundreds of thousands of photographs, marketing material, parts and accessories, personal clothing, uh, artifacts um, in the collection. This is where the motorcycles are housed. We also have a motorcycle collections manager who works up in this space. We do not uh, restore motorcycles. We prepare them for display and storage. These are not runners. So none of these motorcycles are runners, right? We cannot take an old bike off the, off the shelf and go race it or go ride it around an event. These are all um, prepped for storage and display. The idea is to preserve them for the long, time, long term. The collection was built, it started very early in the life of the company, probably in the teens. We started keeping um, one or two motorcycles off the production line every year. So most of these bikes from the production bikes have, you know, maybe five or seven miles on them, on the odometers. We also have prototypes, we have some race bikes, and we have personal bikes in the collection too that we've acquired from individuals. The majority of the motorcycles though are production line vehicles. This is something else, something like Harley Davidson heaven right now. This is crazy. That's 
FXR is pretty. Uh. Look at this. That's where I set her off. The roll glide. I'm like at loss for words right now. I don't. I even know like which one. Uh, I just keep looking everywhere, and every time I look away, like my jaw just drops and drops and drops. It's such a feeling just to be in here right now. It's just crazy. Not everybody gets to be up here. This is the vault. This is this is the official collection up here, man. Like everybody sees us. So let me tell you something. Uh, I wasn't even taking notice of the time. So I literally just spent four and a half hours in there just going around, reading and looking at stuff. And you could literally, if you come here and you take your sweet time, you could actually spend the whole day here. So a lot of stuff I didn't read through, obviously. Um, I was reading through most of the stuff that kind of interested me the most. Um, about four and a half hours there and it feels like I was there for like 40 minutes it's great man so guys if, if you are in the area or if you are gonna travel throughout the country make sure to stop by here man it's just one of those places that you need to come and experience for yourself you need to come and see what they have here just see all the artifacts they have here all the bikes all the information it's great man and just look at this view right here look look at this view that's crazy that's crazy anyways i got um i'm gonna start heading back to the hotel now because i'm starving i'm gonna go grab something to eat and then uh we'll see what else i find myself into